Velkommen. Flott å se at det er så mange i salen. Velkommen til denne første av en serie på fire dokkhuseforelesninger i regi av Fakultet for arkitektur og bildkunst, NTNU, i samarbeid med Norsk Form på dokkhuset. Nå fikk jeg veldig mye lys her. Hele poenget med denne serien her, det er jo at vi har jo en lang tradisjon for å holde gjesteforelesninger ved fakultetet. Det er ofte en litt sånn lukket affære for de som studerer og de som jobber ved NTNU. Og derfor har vi satt i gang denne serien i Dokkhuset for å kunne nå et bredere publikum. Og det er også en av grunnintensjonene for norsk form å spre kunnskap om arkitektur og design ut til folket. Og da er det jo folket vi har i salen her nå. Vi har fire forelesninger. Den første her nå med M2M. Vi får Nils Biller, fjerde i tiende, Karl-Otto Elvesten, åttende i ellefte, og Farid Morshavi, tjuenine i ellefte. Ellers, for de som er nysgjerrig, så er også våre gjesteforelesninger på NTNU åpne for folk fra byen også. De kjører vi nå i mellomrommet oppe på Sentralbygg 1, Gløshaugen. Så tror jeg faktisk at vi skal bare få se veldig kort det teamet som jobber. Jørgen og Mario og Jørgen. Hvis du bare viser dere frem for publiken, for det er nemlig en... Hvis dere reiser dere opp. Ingen som ser det når du sitter der. Det er da teamet som programmerer og ringer rundt og får hele programmet til å skje. Så de skal få en liten kort applaus av dere nå. Så vil jeg gi ordet til Jørgen Joner, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Please, Jørgen. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm very happy that we have once again a guest from Switzerland, Matthias Müller from M2N. They say, we aim to produce architecture that is powerful and personal, architecture with the capability of developing its own character. As a result, our projects may polarize the public, which is fine with us. One may love or hate our architecture, but one should never be left indifferent." End of quote. So, I think this office is one of the very, very interesting ones that we have in Europe. They are growing. They, are, they started in Zurich 15 years ago with uh, some competitions and now they are doing more and more uh, projects not only in Switzerland but in many other countries as well. Matthias Müller, um, he took his education, his own education at the ETH in Zurich and after that he, um, as I said, founded with um, Daniel Nickli, this office M2N in Zurich. And uh, since then they have been not only building and um, planning a lot of projects, but also teaching at the ETH in Zurich and at the APFL in Lausanne. I, yeah, it doesn't make sense that I um, now speak about buildings because Matthias will do that much better. Please welcome our guest, Matthias Müller. Well, thank you very much for those kind words, the introduction, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here tonight. I'm representing um, our office, um, 65 people about, uh, my partner, 
Daniel uh, and I, we kind of divide up. So tonight you have to, you have to uh, bear with me. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me. I love to travel, I have to say. Uh, I love to travel because I believe in the exchange of ideas among architects, among architects and the public, and the public to the architect. We believe in dialogue. We believe in experiencing other cultures uh, in various ways. And uh, it's, it's a must for architects to travel. So also, thank you very much for inviting me uh, today and giving me a wonderful tour of Trondheim. We had a quite an interesting site. Um, we had an interesting site in terms of uh, uh, visiting which architects usually do, massive pieces like this one, but also unimportant things. So what do architects do when they travel? What do they do when they go abroad? They visit these wonderful icons, they measure themselves against the grades of the discipline, they become thoughtful about themselves, they marvel at the spaces, they look at the details carefully, Sometimes they get confused also. And they really try to experience the culture and the, the kind of the, the, the spirit of the place. So when I travel, when I say I like traveling, I say I like traveling, but I like traveling most because I believe in the power of cities, of other cities. So experiencing cities is much more important than the actual piece of uh, architecture. And I'm going to show you some of the cities I've visited uh, in the course of those 15 years which we had the office. We, we can do a little guessing thing. We, we Swiss like to be interactive. We like public votes. So where do you think this might be? Any opinions? Shanghai. Good guess. Any other options? Tokyo. And this one. How about that one? Any opinions? Blue sky? Holland? Warsaw, Poland. Beautiful, isn't it? Very different from Tokyo. Or this one? Good one, good one. Kiev. Why do you say Russia? What makes you think Russia? The smokestacks. Looks like a little bit like Chernobyl in the back. It's not Chernobyl, but <laughs> or this one here, Rio de Janeiro, wonderful, isn't it? Or that one, totally different again, Mumbai. So you see, we go to all these places, but when we look at the recent arch architecture, when we look at the actual things, we get we, we we don't feel the climate. We just look at the pictures. We get this kind of gray haze. We 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 get this kind of picture that places all over this planet, they start looking alike in a very scary way. And this is really troubling me. Maybe, the, maybe it, has to do, it has to do with globalization, probably. Maybe it has to do with the image of the architect. Maybe it's a cultural thing, a thing of, necessi of necessity. This then is, uh, would be Sao Paulo, before we had uh, Shanghai. So when all these places are starting to approach each other, architects become desperate. So what do they do? They go to Venice. <laughs> they go to Venice, they, they fly in, they take the nice speedboat. This is Daniel, my partner, enjoying himself. This is a few years ago. And when you go to Venice, you just have to make sure you go to the right Venice. This was, uh, this was before Venice, the other Venice. How many Venices are there? Anybody, any guesses? To, to my knowledge, it's three. There is uh, this one, which is Macau. Then there is the American Venice and the original one. And when you go to those kind of places, new questions come up, you really ask yourself, well, maybe this is the better kind of Venice. Because you see my kids, two of my kids are on, on, the, on the left side, they are very safe. They can't fall into the canal because the norms, you know, the, the, the nice banisters. And you see the cheerful Chinese lady there. She has a little electric motor under her boat. 
and everybody seems to be happy. This also has to do with the, with the shops they have. They have a very nice, uh, it's a very nice mall, very nice shops, and it's air conditioned. And it doesn't smell like Venice. So maybe it's the better Venice. Plus, everything is there. You see all the icons, the Rialto, the tower. Plus, the traffic solution is much easier. You have a huge kind of a bus station. So these kind of places, they really ask questions. And they, to me, they ask, in Europe, as a European architect, as, a, as an architect coming from a place, what can I contribute or what should my, my stance be? How should I behave in, in such a globalized concept where even places can be copied? And of course, the problem behind the whole thing is this is driving the whole operation, it's money. This is the casino in the bottom. And I'm only showing you a small part because you can't go in, you can't take pictures. Kids are not allowed in. So this, this hall replicates itself about five, six, 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 seven times in the back. I didn't go all the way to the back. Sometimes I was told people have trouble coming, finding the way out of the, the room because they come down from the room through the elevators into this gambling hall. So the question for the architect then is how to generate spaces which are economically viable, which, which can in a globalized context compete with these kind of places. And we also know how these kind of places come about. And this is the kind of disheartening thing to me. When you go to China, this kind of an operation is happening all over the place. So this country is actually forgetting its past, eradicating. This is worse than anything we've seen in Second World War. This is like the bombing of Danzig or whatever. All these tragedies where urban fabric and lifestyles and, and, and grown customs are just eradicated. And this new reality, this new globalized uh, money reality is being placed. So to me, the question of architecture today is how to be specific. And this is why this talk tonight is going to be about transformations not annihilation, but transformation. I believe in transformation. Also, I don't believe in this kind of an attitude to the city. Every decent Chinese city has this kind of a hall, planning hall, where you're made to walk on the city. You, you're made to feel like God, like you're, you're, you're really in charge of placing things at random. This kind of a top-down attitude from a Swiss perspective seems incredibly cynical and also incredibly worthless because the things that are in place are so empty of sense. They are so, they're, they're, there's nothing backing them except for money and maybe copying other models. So coming back to Venice and really standing in the actual Venice and sweating, you know, sunglasses and it's, it's not so nice, it kind of smells and the building on the left side crumbles, the, the plaster is falling off and uh, there are no shops in this canal. Uh, there's no shopping to relieve yourself. You can buy all the stupid souvenirs which I sell there. But coming back to this kind of a place, I feel very European and I think we, we need to have a European standpoint and I think it's worthwhile to put up with all the hardship of these kind of places and really make them work. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget our past. So coming from that, I'm gonna show you just a few examples which we love in the office. We love them because of their well, maybe timelessness, but also there, there's an unexpected moment to them. Uh, you know all of them, but it's just kind of, I think it's worthwhile to, to recall them every once in a while. For example, Split, the Roman Emperor's palace. When he resigned, he went to Split. He built himself this wonderful palace. There was temples, there were public buildings. And this structure over the course of time just got swallowed. I mean, they could have torn it down. In some places, this happened. But no, they kind of invaded, they reinterpreted they, 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 they re the fabric. It became very rich, very dense, and multi-layered. We really love this kind of thing, and we think that Europe, the European situation, really has to do with that. I think we should aim for that. This is why our publication is called Both And. It's not either or, or it's not called we, or us, or great. It's both and, and both and is, is kind of a, it's a slow thing, it's not a sure thing, we're never sure about things, we're always kind of tentatively going forward. For example, when we do an exhibition like we did at the ETH, we like to kind of grab the space, we like to do a specific thing, this is not a traveling exhibition, this is an exhibition which 
is made for the space, it cannot be anywhere else, and it kind of reacts to the elements which are present. So I'm gonna go through a series of projects now trying to explain our way of working and trying to explain why we think that renovations, additions, se sequential work, why this is worthwhile. So I'm gonna start very small. A conversion outside of Zurich. This is a 60s development, very commercial, had some qualities, of course. It was cheap, spacious, nice gardens. And the guy who wanted to build with us had the last house in the row. He's quite a wealthy lawyer, four kids, and he felt cramped in this little building. But his, uh, th the problem was, you see these little yellow, yellowish lines? Those are the building lines on his plot. So he can't do anything. He can't really expand much. And of course, we didn't want to tear down the building. So we went to the building law, and we started looking up the building law, thinking, yeah, what can we do? And we discovered that in this commune, for some freak reason, the law permitted unlimited building to the border under the ground. So we went to him and he said, we can solve your problem. It'll cost a little bit of money. And you will live like uh, people 2,000 years ago lived maybe in China, in these kind of underground things, or maybe in North Africa. But we believe we can make it worthwhile. We can, re re we can really pull it off, and you're going to get around the law and your existing building will stand there and we'll get an addition. So we did this operation. In Switzerland, people are very uptight about building, probably like in Norway. There's this uh, process where you kind of have to indicate where you're building and then all your neighbors can be against it. Here, no one was against it until they saw the hole. <laughs> but then it was too late, of course, we were building. But in the end, we kind of covered up, and the situation slightly changed. There's this kind of uncanny feeling. There's this kind of, there's this feeling something's going on here, but people don't quite know. There is hedonism all of a sudden. This guy has money, so he wants to have fun, so he gets some fun. Why be so Protestant about it all the time? There is useless elements like this kind of outdoor shower. We, we told them, hey, you know, when you're in this hole, you can go out naked into your garden. You can take a shower. No one will see you. He said, great, I want that shower. <laughs> I don't know whether he ever did, but just the thought of being able to do something so nasty is just beautiful in Switzerland, mind you. <laughs> and the surprising thing is the house is actually much more lighter. It's much more open than the above the ground house. So if you do it properly, if you kind of work with the spaces properly, even this impossible situation can be quite nice. And you always have this kind of look to the outside, of course, which the old house didn't have so much. And in the end, after we were all finished, he said, oh, damn, we forgot we still have this kind of crawl space underneath the house in the basement. Can we do something with it? And we did him this kind of really nasty James Bond kind of home private cinema <laughs> where he actually never watches movies but he plays uh, with the Xbox, you know. But <laughs> so we think there, are, there, are, there is a value of accepting a strange situation and escaping and kind of going into unexpected ways and, and trying to create a certain kind of poetry out of that. The next project we're going to show is also housing, a little bit bigger. This is a project we undertook by ourselves. Um, we believe that architects should be not just passive um, recipients of orders from investors or whoever wants to build. We believe that architects should be active themselves. We think there is money to be made with projects, so why not? keep that money for ourselves and become developers, become nasty. So we got our hands dirty and we did a second company. It's not called EM2N, but DN2N, um, which, is a, which is a speculation company. And we, did, we, we took together the little money we had. We bought this old supermarket in a little city outside of Zurich. This thing was something that no one could really, I mean, the, 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 the real estate market in Switzerland is completely oversold. But this thing didn't sell because no one saw the value of it. No one was able to imagine what we could do with it. It looked like this. I mean, it's one of those structures which are 
really useless. You can't have a shop in there. There's no demand for a shop. No one knew what to do. But the nice thing about it was it was four and a half meters high on the inside. So we said, hey, maybe we can use this. Maybe we can do something specific with this space. Maybe we can do a kind of a project that wouldn't happen if this building wouldn't stand there. So we followed the market. We did these five one-family houses. And each of these houses, because the Swiss market has a garden, has a roof, terrace, and also has a double height space. And you see what happened in section. We just kind of dug into the structure, and then, of course, we exploited the possible uh, cubic meters to the utmost. And we kind of nestled these five houses into each other. It's kind of this strange, not cannibalizing, but this strange kind of operation where you kind of like you when, you when you try a suit for the first time, you kind of see if it fits. And the result were these kind of spaces, these four and a half meter high spaces, which then we saw in section on the left side, two rooms are slightly sunk in, which then connect on various levels to various rooms. And that's where we are starting to get into the fun. When working with a structure, you can do something which of course never would happen. You would go to an investor and you would say, hey, let's make a space four and a half meters high. And the guy would say, are you crazy? We're, we're losing cubic meters. We're not going to do it. So these are the kind of things you can do when you accept the situation, when you work with it, and also if you play an active role, if you go into development yourself. I mean, it's very difficult to convince people who are giving money to do, to do these kind of things. Just going to go through this quickly. We are very interested in this kind of topic of deep spaces. There is probably also here in Norway, there's this tendency to do energy efficient houses. They become fatter and fatter. We have more and more insulation. You guys probably have more, but we, we are, well, 30 is, is normal. 35 would be then stretching it a little bit. So these buildings are looking more and more like these, uh, these fat kids, you know, in America. They kind of, you know, they become fatter and fatter, and, and how, how, to, how to bring value into this kind of a tendency. And we believe that this kind of porosity, this internal porosity, these spaces that go into other spaces is a possible solution. It's very nice to see then that some of the people who moved in there that took up our ideas, for example, this family hired a, a color specialist. They had colorful furniture, and, this, and they, they went to this guy and said, hey, can you please introduce some color into, the, into this white box. We don't want to live in a white box. And he kind of worked with them, worked with their furniture, and then just kind of did this color scheme, which then over the use of warm and cold colors uh, even makes it more porous, kind of the, increases the distance between the walls, kind of uh, makes the layering more, more obvious. We didn't inter interfere at all with this process. We just let him do, but I think the result is very nice. I really like this when you deliver a building and people take it up and respond to it and, and start reacting and, and understand the idea and then work on the idea. I don't believe that the architect should be the one controlling everything. I think buildings, as we understand it, we come, the building has a life of its own, we come in, we kind of change the course of the life, then the user comes in, takes it up, brings it on, and then someone else, of course, is going to work again with our work in the future. So these are the things we do when we, when we are developers ourselves. We do this kind of silvery paint, which then caused us a lot of problems, and we do these kind of windows without sunshade, which then also caused us a lot of problems. So now we know why there is sunshade on buildings in Switzerland. But anyway. So I'm, I'm talking about these kind of operations, these kind of small things, like the, like the Fletching Church. You may know this project. It's, it's one of his early projects. I don't even know where Bogogina is. I don't know where, where the church is, but, uh, but I really love this project. You see the old church in black and, and how he totally reinterpreted the situation, how he in red added the new church and kind of created this very complex spatial configuration where, where, where you don't quite understand, but you kind of feel this 
old and new coexistence. I think these kind of layerings, this is very difficult to produce in new architecture. In, in Zurich, when you walk around the new developments, you have this kind of linear, logical order. Everything works. And for me, it sometimes starts being interesting at the point where it doesn't work, where you kind of have resistance to your logic of planning, where you kind of meet resistance, where you have to go around corners, where you don't quite do the obvious. This is when, it, when, when we say a building comes alive, has a life of its own. For example, this project, a little bit bigger housing project. This used to be an office building, again, very fat. You worked on that one. I'm showing this for you. So this is an office building, a fat office building. You could never build it that fat again. The building law changed. It's also a residential neighborhood, so it's kind of a foreign object. And the investor paid a lot of money to buy it. The, 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 the market is really, really overheating. So you have to squeeze the last bit out of this building, the last square meter. But the problem was the floor plan is about 30 meters deep at certain points. So we, of course, we open up the building on the inside, on the outside. But then, how, what to do with this? I mean, one response would have been to clean out the inside and to start from scratch. But we said, for example, it's very interesting. This is an office building, and office buildings have very big staircases, five meters by uh, I don't know, four meters by by maybe ten meters. So this is great. Let's keep the the staircase, for example, because this is gonna give this uh, building a more specific appearance, more specific spaces. So we said, okay, for fire reasons, we have to add a second staircase. And then we kind of connected them. We kind of did this interior kind of, uh, yeah, figure, space, space, spatial figure with these hallways connecting, sometimes not connecting. Again, the same uh, color artist, a friend of ours, started working on it, started also reacting to it creating even more specific situations along it. And around these two staircases, the existing and the added one, we then started to come up with as many different apartments as we could. And these apartments, of course, then go on all sides. They bring light in from all sides. What was very nice, of course, was the high ceiling height, those uh, three meters plus, 310 in some places, which we had. And so you get this quite individual puzzle in this quite ordinary house, and you get this incredible variety of, of, uh, of, of floor plans, which we then found out is something people really like. I mean, sometimes developers, they tell you, we want the perfect apartment for the family with two kids, or for the gay couple, or whatever. And we always say that there, there is no su such thing as the perfect, there is no such thing as the market. There's people, and people are very different. I mean, some people collect art, and other people just watch TV, and some people, they play an instrument, and some people, they want a big space uh, to feel comfortable. Other people need a small space. They would feel lonely. So these kind of economic ideas, these kind of developer ideas, we like to question them. And then these kind of these apartments, they kind of react to each other and they, they dig into each other. There are irrational moments at some places. There are angles happening. We are very fascinated by, by, uh, by old buildings that kind of uh, behind the scenes have these hidden corridors, hidden angles, and so on. For example, that wall, it kind of tilts because it was very difficult to cut that hole so close to the column. So we had to keep a certain distance so the column would still hold. And that was then the reason to make this one wall. And, and that makes that apartment specific. And of course, it's very nice to work in sectional also. We believe that th there's a real problem with this kind of yeah, just stacking of apartments, this flat stacking. When you go from the house, from the one family house, which is the ideal of everybody, when you go from that, to a bigger structure, it's important not to lose space on the way. So there's all these different apartments. Of course, this is on top of the line. This is very expensive, it's luxurious. It's not re representative. But these are principles, spatial principles, ideas, of course, which then can be taken 
to other projects. For example, this apartment is, is right down in the basement. It's kind of a, on the slope. So on one side, it faces the hill. There is no light on one side. So that's where the double height space is. And there's this partial also, which Swiss people are very skeptical about. But this partial, of course, brings light in. Or th there is this apartment where you we enter. And at some point in the apartment, there's just this kind of crazy stair object just kind of screwing up through the ceiling. And you realize, ah, there's something up there. There's two rooms up there. Or there's this one, which kind of is on the co on, uh, is a three-sided one, which kind of gets the light in. This is the one with the tilted wall. Gets the light in over a bathroom into the hall in the middle. Or there's that one, which is like, is like a like a cannonball kind of shot through thing and then has this stair object and, and then widens to, towards the south. And there is, of course, normal ones kind of just going along the facade. These, these apartments, which had no problem, which have two facades and two sides, those we just kept as they were. And we gave them very big glazings. And it was, again, very nice to, re to see how people reacted. This was a free plan. So there is no structural walls except for uh, the staircase. And people just reacted. For example, these people, uh, artist couple, they said, OK, we like curtains. We like moving walls. And uh, the uh, ventilation, which we like to cover as architects, they liked it. So they just painted and left it in there. Wonderful. That's the one with the kitchen going out of the way of the column. And some people just started playing with the room height, hanging things. Of course, you get a lot of artists moving in when architects make the apartment. So it's also ni the nice thing. They bring very nice things into the apartments. Or a situation like that, where the, where the window height just becomes reinterpreted as a kind of a sofa, really nice sitting situation. So this reaction to the buildings really interests us. We also, we also like to visit those buildings after we build them and keep track on how people react to them. Now, moving from the housing, I'm going to go into some more public projects because I think this is something which we, which we stand for as European architects. Public buildings is, is what we should we really be fighting for, um, what we should be striving for, we should build them, we should make them, we should think about public space. And public space, especially in a city like Zurich, which is uh, not a city really, it's, it's kind of undense, it's kind of small, and there's no tradition of public space. But it's a city, and these are these areas which you see, which has been recently converting a lot. Like here also, the industry is going out. Um, we are experiencing this, this change in use. And of course, the question come up, comes up what to do with these areas. And also, the question comes up with the identity of these areas. I'm just going to show you one of those areas, which uh, is very close to our office. Our office is somewhere, somewhere over here. And then this is 19th century. And over there, you have the industrial areas being converted. And I'm just going to go through very quickly what happened in the last, well, 15 years, the time that our office took to, to yeah, establish itself. So all these buildings, all these uses were replaced or were kind of yeah, worked on. All these projects were, were um, proposed by the city or by private investors, not really coordinated, just kind of happening. And you can imagine when you have that kind of a conversion process, the, the real question is in the end, what, what is staying? And what is staying is, 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 even, is even more important if you look at the whole of the city. You see this conversion area on the left side and you see these high rises happening. So you, you see a whole new typology entering the city. The city is really being changed as a new image of the city developing in that place. So the question for us is how to do it. And again, the projects I'm going to show you, most of them are happening there. Again, those projects are, are very much reacting to what is there. So the first small thing is an upgrading of a railway station. Railway stations are, in Switzerland, very important. Public transport has a very high level. It's very important because you can't enter with a car into the city. There is an opposition to cars. Uh, the anti-car Taliban's uh, saving the world. They, at least they spend a lot of money on trains. So this station had a problem, it wasn't visible. 
This is the 10th biggest station in Switzerland, and there's a kind of a street in the air going over it. You didn't see it. And this was the access situation underneath that road bridge, also kind of hostile. So in an act of desperation, because they couldn't really um, find an agreement with the railway, the city of Zurich um, gave three million for a kind of a redecoration. And we, when we got the brief, we, we started laughing. Three million dealing with these kind of infrastructures, what can you do? I mean, it's nothing. It's really no money. What is it, 18, 18 million so crowns? So, so that really doesn't get you anywhere. But we found something in place, in place in all of Switzerland, which is very powerful, which is the system, this kind of guiding system. And there are also being Taliban's about this. All the stations are really worked on with the system. You cannot use elements from that system outside of the context of the station. So this is a very powerful visual tool. And the first thing we did, we hijacked the symbol of the National Railway, which actually my grandfather had helped to develop. He was a graphic artist. Uh, we had a, a lot of fighting sessions and we said, no, we want, we want that sign to come up on that bridge and to show where the station is. And that cost maybe 200,000 francs, but it's a very, very powerful sign. Now you know where it is. And immediately it's associated with train. You don't have to say anything. Every Swiss knows, ah, train station. And of course, the same kind of operation underneath the bridge. And again, there we used paint, we used color, but that time we worked with a kind of a, yeah, street logic. It's, it's, it's a street, it's a very messed up street. So we did what, ev what every good Swiss does every once in a while. We cleaned up the situation and then we painted with street paint. And again, we did a sign. Very simple, just tell, telling people, go there, that's the station. And then, of course, the rest of the money, maybe those two and a half million we spent on widening the axis. And we invented something, which we, we like to do that. We like to take the brief and question the brief and reinvent the brief. And we said, hey, what you need is a coffee place. Uh, when you come to that station in the morning, there's no place to drink coffee. So that's in that triangle down there, that's, let's, let's make an ultra cool coffee space which then at night also can, can glow out. There can be light coming from it. So they accepted it and it's actually functioning well. They're making money with it. Again, that's important. You have to help people to make money. Otherwise, you're not gonna succeed with your project. So that was that. Was that. Right next to that, there is another kind of railroad infrastructure. It's a very different kind of engineering, a very thoughtful structure. It's, it's also kind of disheartening to see how infrastructure is built these days. When you see in Switzerland or in any country, when you see the roadworks, how they are done, when you see bridges, how they are done, when you see infrastructural things, the, the amount of thought that goes into them is immense to make them work. But the aesthetics, the kind of the, yeah, you, you, they, they need, the streets don't just have to work, people have to love them somehow. I mean, you need to care for streets, you need to care for bridges. So how to do it? The engineer who built this railroad bridge, before the city even expanded, he was, he was a very good engineer. He said, okay, the city is coming out and wherever we will have building blocks in the future, I will build in stone. And wherever there's a street crossing to make that crossing of the street easy, I will build a steel bridge. Of course, there, there are some minor accidents that always kind of happen, like down here. But usually the system works quite beautifully. And this guy, he was very much in advance of his time. He, he thought in 50 years, these, these stone blocks together with the city, they're going to form building blocks. And this is, this is what I really love, this proactive thinking of engineers, not just thinking about their part, but thinking about the connection to the city. So they built this beautiful structure. I mean, imagine the resources it took to build this kind of a thing, the, the, the volume needed to, to move, the, 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 the labor to, to, the, that was needed to move that stone, and the result is really breathtaking. It's in the middle of the city, it's this beautiful viaduct, which we have in many cities. And there is, there is in, this, in, this kind of, in this kind of structure, there's a poetry to be found. So you can find, from, from the times, you can find artwork which actually takes up those thoughts, which, which actually, yeah, 
likes, which, which I, you can see how artists related to these kind of structures, how these structures, they, they were a field for imagination. They weren't just there, they were, they were being interpreted and loved. And of course, as time goes by, the upper one is still in use, but the lower one was uh, defunct because, because there was a new tunnel dug, there was a new kind of a connection made. So the city said, let's do something, something with it, and they did a competition. And the competition was to actually bring in uses, bring in uses into these, uh, into these big arches. There were several possibilities to do this. Um, many teams in this competition proposed little houses, cute little architects' houses. And we said, no, the same way that the engineer tried to connect his building with the city, we should try to connect our building again with this building and kind of do this hybrid thing. We shouldn't stand back and place little houses under the viaduct, we, sh we should attack it and we should come up with a new hybrid. And then there is also this idea of creating on that defunct railroad track to, to create a path. And we had to connect the path on the, on the viaduct, of course, with the, with the city. So this is the result of the work. The path up on top which has some very unexpected moments in the middle of the city. You have this uh, waste burning plant, you have this park situation with these kind of Scandinavian trees, really nice. You have unexpected views into the city, frame views, which you can enjoy from up there. And then we have this play between up and down, which we answered very directly. We just kind of said we have houses, we have stairs on which you can walk up. They look like the rest of our installation. They just kind of connect in a very direct way. You see these different situations. Of course, ramps for the bicycles and uh, elevators for the disabled people. Everything had to be worked in. And then the question was how to deal with the how to deal with building, building physics. Of course, then again, the climate Taliban's came and the protectionist Taliban's came. And uh, the climate people said, you have to really insulate this and the problem really is the stone. We're gonna have thermal bridges on the corners. We're gonna have water, condensing water and so on. Uh, the other guys said, we want to see that stone. It has to be protected. You have to be able to experience it. And we said, this is, this is something we cannot solve. So we actually said this time as an architect, we cannot solve this problem. They had a big fight. In the end, the climate Taliban's lost and the protection Taliban's won. And so we were able to actually really kind of just make this minimal intervention, which in Switzerland is very rare. And what we were aiming for is this kind of, a, is this kind of an effect. This is a, a, a Roman stadium, a Colosseum in, in Arles which uh, when the Roman city, when the Romans went and, and, the, and the Dark Ages came afterwards, people just kind of retreated and they kind of formed this new hybrid. We, we think it's wonderful to kind of have this, uh, this intermingling of the times and structures and this reinterpretation of structures. And so we just kind of filled it up over the whole length with these huts. The challenge then of course, which I'm sure would, would be the same challenge here, was how to make it affordable. The original idea was to, make a, to create a place where artisans or people working manually, they could find an atelier. And uh, it showed soon that the laws, the, let's say, workplace laws, with the train going, going through above it, with the vibrations and so on, they, they really prevented cheap solutions. So the project started getting more and more expensive, and it's actually a fight which we lost. Uh, these, these arches that were the, in the end, they were occupied by shops. So in the end, it's a kind of a design open air shopping mall, which is really a shame. We would have liked to do it much more direct, but we had no chance. And in the inside, we didn't, we didn't really use much money. We tried to be as simple as possible. But sometimes you just kind of have to acknowledge commercial realities and you, you, ca you can't do much about it. So it's quite unfortunate to see how this is now inhabited. 
there are there are of course some nice moments. There is a, there is a church for young people, for example. There is a, a salsa dancing club. Uh, there is a bi bicycle repair shop, and in the front, there's again something we invented. The the program of the competition didn't know what to do with this in between space where those two infrastructures come apart, and we proposed to build a market hall there. And that is kind of a success, I have to say. It's, it's a big hall space. Again, there we had to follow the regulations and. For example, the fire police, they wanted sprinklers. And the sanitation people said, yes, but we have to be very careful inside uh, with the food. We have to make sure that the food, uh, that there are sometimes birds flying around in these kind of halls. We have to make sure that the bird shit doesn't get on the food. So we need these umbrellas over the stands, over the food selling stands. So we said, OK, we'll do the umbrellas. But then the fire people came again and they said, yeah, if you do that, then the sprinkler doesn't reach the burning things underneath. Can we do another sprinkler underneath the stand? This kind of thing, you understand. It's probably the same thing here. So, so building is also becoming more and more insane, and we really have to be careful in an international context not to go totally crazy. So on the outside, I'm showing you this. We, we, did, we did something very direct. This is kind of a latex cover. I'm sure you have it here, too. If you, if you put something soft underneath it, it becomes this kind of... Um, yeah, semi-nasty uh, sofa cushion, domin domina maybe kind of thing, and on the on the inside we just we, we just went cheap. We did a white space with bigger lights, and you see the technology. There's floor heating in the market hall. Underneath it, there is a huge space for refrigeration and so on. So it's very very difficult these days to do normal projects. But still, I mean, it's a success commercially. It's still a place where people meet. So we're halfway satisfied, I have to say. Another project, again in the city, on the other side of the tracks. It's a renovation of a 1960s building. I'm sure you have this issue here too a lot. These 60s building, architects like them. Everybody else hates them. <coughs> what to do with them? This was a building, a protected building by Otto Klaus, who was a student of Corbusier. It was built 1966, in the year I was born. And he clearly took the picture of Ronchon, of this cloister. Um, he did this kind of an interior courtyard. He worked with concrete, very nice. These are separate buildings, uh, school buildings. Uh, students learn, learn manual labor there. He planted kind of a, again, kind of a Mediterranean tree in there, Mediterranean landscape, beautiful job. And the question was now how to do an addition to this kind of building. We decided, I'm going to go back, we decided to split the, split the program and attach one part on the lower side to the existing 60s building and one part of the program to an 80s building on the other side, creating this kind of public path in between. And then for that existing building, the uh, design process was actually very simple. We just analyzed what was there. And when you see, the co uh, when you see that uh, composition, you realize that these workshops are kind of forming a, a, a circle or kind of a, an outer ring. Then there is uh, secondary buildings which are inside, placed in, in the courtyard, which kind of create spaces in the courtyard. There's a public walkway or an out, uh, outdoor walkway in between. And then there is this cool green, we call it irrational moment, kind of a sculptural moment where, where the architect really kind of became an architect. So we said, OK, let's do the same thing. Let's create a, a building for the classrooms. And then for the secondary rooms, like the toilets and so, we, we were going to create a little building. Then we're going to create a super small walkway. And then we're also going to be architects and create an irrational moment. And for that irrational moment, we took his irrational moment and kind of just morphed it. So you, you see, you see this, this logic of the plan, which is then very simply added to. This is, uh, this is uh, just uh, classrooms and, and a very wide uh, uh, hallway. This wide hallway, of course, references back to his outdoor uh, walkways, but it's an indoor space. 
And we really liked the tight spaces he created between his buildings, so we kind of pushed our new concrete building very close to his. And here's that irrational moment I was talking about. The, uh, on top of the, of the wood workshop, he had this chimney. And the chimney had a kind of a storage tank. I think the story, when he was trying to build this, he told these people, yeah, we can use the, the, the wood chippings, you know, the things left over. And we can climb up that ladder and we can throw them in and we can use them uh, for burning. Of course, it never worked, but he got to build this thing. <laughs> Great, the architect, typical architect's trick, we like that. So we said, okay, let's do the same thing. And we kind of uh, worked a long time on that column, on, on, on that element. And we said, yeah, we, we need to make a, a public throughway. And we kind of made it into a column which also we went to great length uh, to sell that to the city of Zurich, but they actually somehow bought it. So now, now you have the same elements if in a new configuration. You recognize certain elements, and uh, the whole thing kind of, kind of has a new logic. Next project I'm gonna show you is kind of a, ah, yes, beer, beer break, great. I really like this place. I was told after, after 40 minutes we get a beer break, I, I get one too maybe, and then we're gonna do the rest of the story. Is that okay for everybody? 